Thank you very much. I want to I want to thank um, everyone responsible for putting this conference on because it's already it's really great, and I just think it's going to get better. I hope it keeps on getting better. But um, I want to say that uh, I'm temperamentally inclined to pessimism, and um, and my Catholic faith encourages me to be hopeful. Uh, <laughs> but on November third. On November 3rd, um, something happened that none of you in your lifetime have seen that I've been waiting all my life to see. And of course, it's the Cubs won the World Series <laughs> for the first time since 1908. So um, that has brightened my outlook, uh, even, even in the gloom. So, um, so I want to invite you to consider the state of knowledge in the fields of architecture and urbanism and its significance for cultural, cultural formation and, evangeliz and evangelization, and of course, in 10 minutes, that's, that's the challenge. So regarding cultural formation, for mere succinctness, I cite Winston Churchill's offering during the debates in London about how exactly to rebuild the parliament buildings damaged by Nazi bombers during the Blitz, in the course of which Sir Winston advocated the reconstruction of parliament to its previous form by arguing famously that, quote, we shape our buildings and then they shape us, end quote. An argument with which I agree, but to which I would add, uh, and then we shape our buildings and then they shape us, and then we shape our buildings and then they shape us, etc. From age to age the same. Regarding evangelization, I note some other familiar words uh, from a gifted theologian subsequently called to other duties. The only really effect, quote, the only really effective apologia for Christianity comes down to two arguments, namely the saints the church has produced and the art which has grown in her womb. Better witness is born to the Lord by the splendor of holiness and art than by the clever excuses which apologetics has come up with to justify the dark sides which sadly are so frequent in the church's human history, end quote. Visual, sorry, thank you. Visual is very important. Now, we can be confident that Joseph Ratzinger believes apologetics properly understood both is and serves an end higher than clever excuses. And yet, is it not striking that this champion and defender of the importance of truth, and surely to the power of truth, suggests that resplendent goodness and resplendent beauty bear even more effective witness to the Lord? This clarifies a critical element of the vocation of artists in particular, that contrary to what we are sometimes encouraged to think, excellence in an art truly is best understood as evangelization. The artist's evangelical method, however, is of a certain kind, the form of which differs from the discursive evangelization of the preacher or the theologian. The artist serves beauty and the theologian serves truth, but each in their vocation work in service to God and for the glorification of God. So what's the specific vocation of an architect who perforce is also a knowing or unknowing urbanist. Architecture has multiple ends, often in tension. Let me mention three. One can be defined with reference to a patron who commissions an architect to design a building to whom the architect has an obligation to address the variety of practical and formal issues important to the patron. A second end can be defined with reference to the architectural community itself and its own internal history and standards of excellence. These standards include not only the classical Vitruvian architectural virtues of durability, convenience, beauty, and decorum, but also particular works of architecture that function as iconic and authoritative points of reference for architects first to emulate, and then, if they are good enough, to surpass. For architects, this second end is primarily aesthetic rather than pragmatic. 
And although the aesthetic concerns of architects cannot supersede in importance the pragmatic concerns of their patrons, for if they did, much less architecture would actually get built, aesthetic concerns are nevertheless the essence of architecture and distinguish architecture from mere building, to which architecture is nevertheless at all times intrinsically connected. Yet a third end of architecture, beyond the good of the patron, beyond the good of the community of architects, is the good of the city. Indeed, this third end is implied in the architectural virtue of decorum, the virtue that unites patrons and the community of architecture with that larger community, which is the city. But this third end implies, again, something else and something more, that architecture is not only an end in itself, but also a contributing means to some higher end, as well as one tangible manifestation of that higher end. This higher end is the good life for human beings, and in an even more direct and fundamental way, the good life for human beings is also the end for which both the city and the architecture within it exist. Now, I trust you recognize the Aristotelian structure of this account of the multiple telloi of architecture and urbanism, its consonance with the Catholic understanding of human nature, the city of man, and the city of God, and that this way of thinking about architecture and urbanism has occupied a central place in the, uh, in the imagination of historic Western civilization. Nevertheless, both today, both knowledge of and belief in these traditional canons uh, of architectural knowledge are, at best, uh, unevenly distributed. In neither the architectural academy nor the culture at large does this traditional way of thinking about architecture and urbanism predominate. Modern life uh, is more motion than calm, more mobility than place. It institutionalizes the disposable over the durable, the temporal over the timeless, novelty over beauty. Our views today of architecture and urbanism are utilitarian and individualistic. All of these have affected our teaching institutions, but most importantly, their effects are visible in the environments we make now and have been making for the last 70 years. This is not to say that traditional architecture and urbanism are completely absent from our lives, if only because that was the built environment that existed prior to 1945, and it was built pretty well. But much of that more tr traditional built environment, at least in America, has been demolished or abandoned in the succeeding seven decades. And it's not that uh, traditional architecture and urbanism are not popular. Uh, indeed, what remains of it has been saved, what remains of it that has been saved and restored is so popular as to be unaffordable uh, by any uh, but the wealthy, unaffordable to any by the, but the wealthy. Nevertheless, for the most part, traditional architecture and urban, urbanism today is an architecture and urbanism we consume rather than an architecture and urbanism we make, which we also have been exporting, the architecture we, that we now make, uh, we've been exporting to much of the world. Nor is traditional architecture and urbanism completely absent from our schools, as 25 years of Notre Dame architecture graduates can attest. They all get jobs, by the way, too. Um, but it's true, it's true that Notre Dame is an extreme outlier. It's also possible that contemporary architecture schools uh, of all intellectual and aesthetic persuasions may be living on borrowed time. Um, though it's hopeful to recall that arguably the most beautiful architecture and most beautiful cities in the world have been designed by architects who were not taught in schools. But it's true, but who learned their craft as working artists within a larger culture of good building. That indeed is my hope for our Notre Dame graduates, um, that we have equipped them well to live in a world necessarily more local than global, where in patient daily craftsmanship they can do good work and plant the seedlings for a more beautiful world that gladdens their neighbors and glorifies God. One of the basic outlines of the program there 
two, two marching orders. Um, first, uh, do no harm. <laughs> and then the second is don't teach anything that has to be unlearned. <laughs> so in preparation for today, I went back and I watched um, Dana Joya's uh, wonderful talk from two years ago on Catholic imagination and contemporary culture. Um, it's really great. You should all go back and, uh, and watch it. Um, and I want to conclude with something that Dana said um, in the Q&A session, uh, actually in response to a question from Ron. Um, so Dana, Dana said uh, at the time, he said, in case anybody doesn't know this, it does not help you as an artist to identify yourself as a Catholic. At the best, it's considered a social disease. At worst, a kind of tremendous moral failing. My motto really is that Catholic artists should say, we're here, we're queer, we're not going away. <laughs> I tip my hat to Dana because he got a laugh with it uh, back then as well. So he continues, there's a time when we simply have to step forward. If you don't witness the truth, it can't be very true to you. It can't be very important to you. My experience has been that once you begin to articulate something, it gives other people the courage to come behind it. I believe that as Catholic artists, and he said Catholic writers, but I'm plugging in the word artists. I believe that as Catholic artists, we need to create a big tent, nourish our own community, start our own conversations, and then just see where it goes. So I think the time, still quoting Dana, uh, so I think the time has come that we have to step forward and be public. Mm -hmm.